Chapter Six, Part Six to Ten of *The Passionate Friends* by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. Chapter the Sixth, Lady Mary Justin. Six. I have a vivid vignette in my memory of my return to my father's house down through the pine woods and by the winding path across the deep valley that separated our two ridges i was thinking of mary and nothing but mary in all the world and of the friendly sweetness of her eyes and the clean strong sharpness of her voice that sweet white figure of rachel that had been creeping to an ascendancy in my imagination was moonlight to her sunrise I knew it was Mary I loved, and had always loved. I wanted passionately to be as she desired, the friend she demanded, that intimate brother and confederate, but all my heart cried out for her, cried out for her altogether. I would be her friend, I repeated to myself, I would be her friend. I would talk to her often, plan with her, work with her, I could put my meanings into her life, and she should throw her beauty over mine. I began already to dream of the talk of tomorrow's meeting. 7. And now let me go on to tell at once the thing that changed life for both of us altogether, that turned us out of the courses that seemed set for us, our spacious, successful, and divergent ways she to the tragedy of her death, and I, from all the prospects of the public career that lay before me, to the work that now, toilsomely, inadequately, and blunderingly enough, I do. It was to pierce and slash away the appearances of life for me, it was to open my way to infinite disillusionment, and unsuspected truths. Within a few weeks of our second meeting, Mary and I were passionately in love with one another. We had, indeed, become lovers. The arrested attractions of our former love released again, drew us inevitably to that. We tried to seem outwardly only friends, with this hot glow between us. Our tormented secret was half discovered, and half betrayed itself. There followed a tragic comedy of hesitations and disunited struggle. Within four months the crisis of our two lives was past. It is not within my purpose to tell you, my son, of the particular events, the particular comings and goings, the chance words, the chance meetings, the fatal momentary misunderstandings that occurred between us. I want to tell of something more general than that. This misadventure is in our strain. It is our inheritance. It is a possibility in the inheritance of all honest and emotional men and women. There are, no doubt, people altogether cynical and adventurous to whom these passions and desires are at once controllable and permissible indulgences, without any radiation of consequences a secret and detachable part of life. And there may be people of conviction so strong and simple that these disturbances are eliminated. But we Stratons are of a quality neither so low nor so high. We stoop and rise. We are not convinced about our standards. And for many generations to come, with us and with such people as the Christians, and indeed with most of our sort of people, we shall be equally desirous of free and intimate friendship, and prone to blaze into passion and disaster at that proximity. This is one of the essential riddles in the adaptation of such human beings as ourselves to that greater civilized state of which I dream. It is the gist of my story. It is one of the two essential riddles that confront our kind the servitude of sex and the servitude of labor, 
are the twin conditions upon which human society rests to-day, the two limitations upon its progress towards a greater social order, to that greater community, those uplands of light and happy freedom, towards which that being, who was my father yesterday, who thinks in myself to-day, and who will be you to-morrow, and your sons after you, by his very nature, urges, and must continue to urge the life of mankind. The story of myself and Mary is a mere incident in that gigantic, scarce conscious effort to get clear of toils and confusions and encumbrances, and have our way with life. We are like little figures, dots ascended upon a vast hillside. I take up our intimacy for an instant, and hold it under a lens for you. I become more than myself then, and Mary stands for innumerable women. It happened yesterday, and it is just a part of that same history that made Edmund Stratton of the Hayes elope with Charlotte Anstruther and get himself run through the body at Haddington two hundred years ago, which drove the Laidlaw Christians to Virginia in forty-five, gave Stratton Street to the money-lenders when George the Fourth was regent, and broke the heart of Margaret Stratton in the days when Charles the First was king. With our individual variations and under changed conditions, the old desires and impulses stirred us, the old antagonisms confronted us, the old difficulties and slows and impassable places baffled us. There are times when I think of my history among all those widespread repeated histories, until it seems to me that the human lover is like a creature who struggles forever through a thicket without an end. There are no universal laws of affection and desire, but it is manifestly true that for most of us, free talk, intimate association, and any real fellowship between men and women turns with an extreme readiness to love. And that being so, it follows that under existing conditions, the unrestricted meeting and companionship of men and women in society is a monstrous sham, a merely dangerous pretense of encounters. The safe reality beneath those liberal appearances is that a woman must be content with the easy friendship of other women, and of one man only, letting a superficial friendship towards all other men veil impassable abysses of separation, and a man must in the same way have one sole woman intimate. To all other women he must be a little blind, a little deaf, politely inattentive. He must respect the transparent, intangible, tacit purda about them. Respect it, but never allude to it. To me that is an intolerable state of affairs, but it is reality. If you live in the spirit of any other understanding, you will court social disaster. I suppose it is a particularly intolerable state of affairs to us Stratons, because it is in our nature to want things to seem what they are. That translucent yet impassable purda outrages our veracity. And it is plain to me that our social order cannot stand, and is not standing, the tensions it creates. The convention that passions and emotions are absent when they are palpably present broke down between Mary and myself, as it breaks down in a thousand other cases, as it breaks down everywhere. Our social life is honeycombed and rotten with secret hidden relationships. The rigid, the obtuse, and the unscrupulously cunning escape. The honest passion sooner or later flares out and destroys. Here is a difficulty that no bullying imposition of arbitrary rules on the one hand, nor any reckless abandonment of law on the other, can solve. Humanity has yet to find its method in sexual things. It has to discover the use and the limitation of jealousy. 
and before it can even begin to attempt to find. It has to cease its present timid, secret groping in shame and darkness, and turn on the light of knowledge. None of us knows much, and most of us do not even know what is known. 8. The house is very quiet today. It is your mother's birthday, and you three children have gone with her and Mademoiselle Potin into the forest to celebrate the occasion. Presently I shall join you. The sunlit garden, with its tall dreaming lilies against the trellised vines upon the wall, the cedars and the grassy space about the sundial, have that distinguished stillness, that definite, palpable, and almost outlined emptiness, which is, so to speak, your negative presence. It is like a sheet of sunlit colored paper, out of which your figures have been cut. There is a commotion of birds in the jasmine, and your barker reclines with an infinite tranquillity, a masterless dog, upon the lawn. I take up this writing again after an interval of some weeks. I have been in Paris, attending the sabotage conference, and dealing with those intricate puzzles of justice and discipline and the secret sources of contentment that have to be solved if sabotage is ever to vanish from labor struggles again. I think a few points have been made clearer in that curious riddle of reconciliations. Now I resume this story. I turn over the sheets that were written and finished before my departure, and come to the notes for what is to follow. Perhaps my days of work in Paris have carried my mind on beyond the point at which I left the narrative. I sit, as it were, among a pile of memories that are now all disordered and mixed up together, their proper sequences and connections lost. I cannot trace the phases through which our mutual passion rode up through the restrained and dignified intentions of our friendship. But I know that presently we were in a white heat of desire. There must have been passages that I now altogether forget, moments of tense transition. I am more and more convinced that our swiftest, intensest mental changes leave far less vivid memories than impressions one receives when one is comparatively passive. And of this phase in my life of which I am now telling, I have clear memories of a time when we talked like brother and sister, or like angels, if you will. And hard upon that came a time when we were planning in all our moments together how and when and where we might meet in secret, and meet again. Things drift with a phantom-like uncertainty into my mind, and pass again. Those fierce motives of our transition have lost now all stable form and feature. But I believe there was a curious, tormenting urgency in our jealousy of those others, of Justin on my part, and of Rachel on hers. At first we had talked quite freely about Rachel, had discussed my conceivable marriage with her. We had indeed a little forced that topic, as if to reassure ourselves of the honesty of our new footing. But the force that urged us nearer pervaded all our being. It was hard enough to be barred apart, to snatch back our hands from touching, to avoid each other's eyes, to hurry a little out of the dusk towards the lit house and its protecting servants. But the constant presence and suggestion of those others from whom there were no bars, or towards whom bars could be abolished at a look, at an impulse, exacerbated that hardship, roused a fierce, insatiable spirit of revolt within us. At times we grew angry with each other's formalism, came near to quarreling. I associate these moods with the golden stillnesses of a prolonged and sultry autumn, and with slowly falling leaves. I will not tell you how that step was taken, it matters very little to my story. Nor will I tell which one of us it was, first broke the barriers down. 9. 
but I do want to tell you certain things. I want to tell you them because they are things that affect you closely. There was, almost from the first, a difference between Mary and myself in this, that I wanted to be public about our love. I wanted to be open and defiant, and she hesitated. She wanted to be secret. She wanted to keep me. I sometimes think that she was moved to become my mistress because she wanted to keep me. But she also wanted to keep everything else in her life, her position, her ample freedoms and wealth and dignity. Our love was to be a secret cavern in Dimion's cave. I was ready enough to do what I could to please her, and for a time I served that secrecy. Lied, pretended, agreed to false addresses, assumed names, and tangled myself in a network of furtive proceedings. These are things that poison and consume honest love. You will learn soon enough, as you grow to be a man, that beneath the respectable assumptions of our social life there is an endless intricate world of subterfuge and hidden and perverted passion, for all passion that wears a mask is perversion, and that thousands of people of our sort are hiding and shamming about their desires, their gratifications, their true relationships. I do not mean the open offenders, for they are mostly honest and gallant people, but the men and women who sin in the shadows, the people who are not clean and scandalous, but immoral and respectable. This underworld is not for us. I wish that I, who have looked into it, could in some way inoculate you now against the repetition of my misadventure. We Stratons are daylight men, and if I work now for widened facilities of divorce, for an organized freedom and independence of women, and greater breadth of toleration, it is because I know in my own person the degradations, the falsity, the bitterness that can lurk beneath the inflexible pretensions of the established code today. And I want to tell you, too, of something altogether unforeseen that happened to us, and that was this, that from the day that passion carried us, and we became, in the narrower sense of the word, lovers, all the wider interests we had in common, our political intentions, our impersonal schemes, began to pass out of our intercourse. Our situation closed upon us like a trap and hid the sky. Something more intense had our attention by the feet, and we used our wings no more. I do not think that we even had the real happiness and beauty and delight of one another, because, I tell you, there is no light upon kiss or embrace that is not done with pride. I do not know why it should be so, but people of our race and quality are a little ashamed of mere gratification in love. Always we seem in my memory to have been whispering with flushed cheeks and discussing interminably situation. Had something betrayed us, might something betray, was this or that sufficiently cunning? Had we perhaps left a footmark or failed to burn a note, was the second footman who was detailed as my valet, even now pausing astonished in the brushing of my clothes, with our crumpled secret in his hand? Between myself and the clear vision of this world about me, this infernal network of precautions spread like a veil. And it was not only a matter of concealments, but of positive deceptions. The figure of Justin comes back to me. It is a curious thing that in spite of our bitter antagonism and the savage jealousy we were to feel for one another, there has always been, and there remains now in my thought of him, a certain liking, a regret at our opposition, a quality of friendliness. His broad face which the common impression and the caricaturist make so powerful and eagle-like, 
is really not a brutal or heavy face at all. It is no doubt aquiline, after the fashion of an eagle owl, the mouth and chin broad, and the eyes very far apart. But there is a minute puckering of the brows, which combines with that queer streak of brown discoloration that runs across his cheek and into the white of his eyes, to give something faintly plaintive and pitiful to his expression, an effect enhanced by the dark softness of his eyes. They are gentle eyes. It is absurd to suppose them the eyes of a violently forceful man. And indeed they do not belie Justin. It is not by vehemence or pressure that his wealth and power have been attained. It is by the sheer detailed abundance of his mind. In that queer big brain of his there is something of the calculating boy, and not a little of the chess champion. He has a kind of financial gift. He must be rich, and grows richer. What else is there for him to do? How many times have I not tried to glance carelessly at his face, and scrutinize that look in his eyes, and ask myself, was that his usual look, or was it lit by an instinctive jealousy? Did he perhaps begin to suspect? I had become a persistent visitor in the house. He might well be jealous of such minor favors as she showed me, for with him she talked but little and shared no thoughts. His manner with her was tinctured by an habituated despair. They were extraordinarily polite and friendly with one another. I tried a hundred sophistications of my treachery to him. I assured myself that a modern woman is mistress and owner of herself, no chattel and so forth. But he did not think so, and neither she nor I were behaving as though we thought so. In innumerable little things we were doing our best tacitly to reassure him. And so you see me shaking hands with this man affecting an interest in his topics and affairs, staying in his house, eating his food and drinking his wine, that I might be the nearer to his wife. It is not the first time that has been done in the world. There are esoteric codes to justify all I did. I perceive there are types of men to whom such relationships are attractive by the very reason of their illicit excitement. But we Strattons are honest people. There is no secret of passion in our blood. This is no game for us. Never you risk the playing of it, little son, big son as you will be when you read the story. Perhaps, but I hope indeed not, this may reach you too late to be a warning, come to you in mid-situation. Go through with it, then, inheritor of mine and keep as clean as you can. Follow the warped honor that is still left to you. And if you can, come out of the tangle. It is not only Justin haunts the memories of that furtive time, but Rachel Moore. I see her still as she was then, a straight, white-dressed girl with big brown eyes that regarded me now with perplexity now with a faint dismay. I still went over to see her, and my manner had changed. I had nothing to say to her now, and everything to hide. Everything between us hung arrested, and nothing could occur to make an end. I told Mary I must cease my visits to the moors. I tried to make her feel my own sense of an accumulating cruelty to Rachel. "'But it explains away so much,' she said. "'If you stop going there, everyone will talk, everything will swing round, and point here.' "'Rachel!' I protested. "'No,' she said, overbearing me. "'You must keep on going to Riding Hanger. You must, you must.' For a long time I had said nothing to Mary of the burthen these pretenses were to me. It had seemed a monstrous ingratitude to find the slightest flaw 
in the passionate love and intimacy she had given me. But at last the divergence of our purposes became manifest to us both. A time came when we perceived it clearly and discussed it openly. I have still a vivid recollection of a golden October day, when we had met at the edge of the plantation that overlooks Bears Hill. She had come through the gardens into the pine wood, and I had jumped the rusty banked stream that runs down the Bears Hill Valley, and clambered the barbed wire fence. I came up the steep bank, and threw a fringe of firs to where she stood in the shade. I kissed her hand, and discovered mine had been torn open by one of the thorns of the wire, and was dripping blood. "'Mind my dress,' she said, and we laughed as we kissed with my arm held aloof. We sat down side by side upon the warm pine needles that carpeted the sand, and she made a mothering fuss about my petty wound, and bound it in my handkerchief. We looked together across the steep gorge at the blue ridge of trees beyond. Anyone, she said, might have seen us this minute. I never thought, I said, and moved a foot away from her. It's too late if they have, said she, pulling me back to her. Over beyond there, that must be Hindhead, someone with a telescope. That's less credible, I said and it occurred to me that the grey stretch of downland beyond must be the ridge to the west of Riding Hanger. I wish, I said, it didn't matter. I wish I could come and go and fear nobody, and spend long hours with you, oh, at our ease. Now, she said, we spend short hours. I wonder if I would like it's no good, Stephen, letting ourselves think of things that can't be. Here we are. Kiss that hand, my lover, there, just between wrist and thumb, the little hollow. Yes, exactly there. But thoughts had been set going in my mind. Why, I said presently, should you always speak of things that can't be? Why should we take all this, as if it were all that there could be. I want long hours. I want you to shine all the day through on my life. Now, dear, it's as if the sun was shown ever and again, and then put back behind an eclipse. I come to you half-blinded, I go away unsatisfied. All the world is dark in between, and little phantom yous float over it. She rested her cheek on her hand, and looked at me gravely. "'You are hard to satisfy, Brother Hart,' she said. "'I live in snatches of brightness, and all the rest of life is waiting and thinking and waiting. "'What else is there? Haven't we the brightness?' "'I want you,' I said. "'I want you altogether. "'After so much?' I want the more. Mary, I want you to come away with me. No, listen. This life, don't think I'm not full of the beauty, the happiness, the wonder, but it's a suspense. It doesn't go on. It's just a dawn, dear, a splendid dawn, a glory of color and brightness and freshness and hope, and no sun rises. I want the day. Everything else has stopped with me and stopped with you. I do nothing with my politics now. I pretend. I have no plans in life except plans for meeting you and meeting you again. I want to go on. I want to go on with you and take up work and the world again. You beside me. I want you to come out of all this life, out of all this immense wealthy emptiness of yours. Stop she said, and listen to me, Stephen. She paused with her lips pressed together, her brows a little knit. I won't, she said slowly. I am going on like this. 
I and you are going to be lovers, just as we are lovers now, secret lovers. And I am going to help you in all your projects, hold your party together, for you will have a party. My house shall be at center. But Justin, he takes no interest in politics. He will do what pleases me. I took some time before I answered. You don't understand how men feel, I said. She waited for what else I had to say. I lay prone and gathered together and shaped and reshaped a little heap of pine needles. You see, I can't do it. I want you. She gripped a handful of my hair and tugged hard between each word. Haven't you got me? she asked between her teeth. What more could you have? I want you openly. She folded her arms beneath her. No, she said. For a little while, neither of us spoke. It's the trouble of the deceit? she asked. It's the deceit. We can stop all that, she said. I looked up at her face inquiringly. By having no more to hide, she said, with her eyes full of tears, if it's nothing to you. It's everything to me, I said. It's overwhelming me. Oh, Mary, heart of my life, my dear, come out of this. Come with me. Come and be my wife. Make a clean thing of it. Let me take you away, and then let me marry you. I know it's asking you to come to a sort of poverty. But Mary's blue eyes were alight with anger. Isn't it a clean thing now, Stephen? She was crying. Do you mean that you and I aren't clean now? Will you never understand? Oh, clean, I answered, clean as Eve in the garden. But can we keep clean? Won't the shadow of our falsehoods darken at all? Come out of it while we are still clean. Come with me. Justin will divorce you. We can stay abroad and marry and come back. Mary was kneeling up now with her hands upon her knees. Come back to what? she cried. Parliament, after that? You boy, you sentimentalist, you, you duffer. Do you think I'd let you do it, for your own sake even? Do you think I want you spoiled? We should come back to mope outside of things. We should come back to fret our lives out. I won't do it, Stephen, I won't do it. End this, if you like. Break our hearts and throw them away, and go on without them, but to turn all our lives into a scandal, to give ourselves over to the mean and the malicious, a prey to old women, and you damned out of everything, a man partly forgiven, a man who went wrong for a woman. No! She sprang lightly to her feet and stood over me as I knelt before her. And I came here to be made love to, Stephen. I came here to be loved, and you talk that nonsense. You remind me of everything wretched. She lifted up her hands and then struck down with them, a gesture of infinite impatience. Her face as she bent to me was alive with a friendly anger, her eyes suddenly dark. You duffer, she repeated. Pen Discovery followed hard upon that meeting. I had come over to Martin's with some book as a pretext. The man had told me that Lady Mary awaited me in her blue parlour, and I went unannounced through the long gallery to find her. The door stood a little ajar. I opened it softly so that she did not hear me, and saw her seated at her writing-desk with her back to me, and her cheek and eyebrow just touched by the sunlight from the open terrace window. She was writing a note. I put my hand about her shoulder, and bent to kiss her as she turned. 
Then, as she came round to me, she started, was for a moment rigid, then thrust me from her, and rose very slowly to her feet. I turned to the window, and became as rigid, facing Justin. He was standing on the terrace, staring at us, with a face that looked stupid and inexpressive and very white. The sky behind him, appropriately enough, was full of the tattered inky onset of a thunderstorm. So we remained for a lengthy second, perhaps, a trite tableau vivant. We too seemed to hang helplessly upon Justin, and he was the first of us to move. He made a queer, incomplete gesture with one hand, as if he wanted to undo the top button of his waistcoat, and then thought better of it. He came very slowly into the room. When he spoke, his voice had neither rage nor denunciation in it. It was simply conversational. "'I felt this was going on,' he said. And then to his wife, with the note of one who remarks dispassionately on a peculiar situation, yet somehow it seemed wrong and unnatural to think such a thing of you. His face took on something of the vexed look of a child who struggles with a difficult task. "'Do you mind?' he said to me. "'Will you go?' I took a moment for my reply. "'No,' I said. "'Since you know at last, there are things to be said.' "'No,' said Mary, suddenly. "'Go. Let me talk to him.' "'No,' I said. "'My place is here beside you.' He seemed not to hear me. His eyes were fixed on Mary. He seemed to think he had dismissed me, and that I was no longer there. His mind was not concerned about me, but about her. He spoke as though what he said had been in his mind, and no doubt it had been in his mind for many days. "'I didn't deserve this,' he said to her. "'I've tried to make your life as you wanted your life. It's astonishing to find—I haven't. You gave no sign. I suppose I ought to have felt all this happening, but it comes upon me surprisingly. I don't know what I'm to do." He became aware of me again. "'And you,' he said, "'what am I to do? To think that you—well, I have been treating her like some sacred thing!' The color was creeping back into his face. Indignation had come into his voice, the first yellow lights of rising jealousy showed in his eyes. "'Stephen,' I heard Mary say, "'will you leave me to talk to my husband?' "'There is only one thing to do,' I said. "'What is the need of talking? We two are lovers, Justin.' I spoke to both of them. "'We two must go out into the world, go out now, together. This marriage of yours, it's no marriage, no real marriage.' "'I think I said that.' I seem to remember saying that, perhaps with other phrases that I have forgotten. But my memory of what we said and did, which is so photographically clear of these earlier passages that I believe I can answer for every gesture and nearly every word that I have set down, becomes suddenly turbid. The high tension of our first confrontation was giving place to a flood of emotional impulse. We all became eager to talk, to impose interpretations and justifications upon our situation. We all three became divided between our partial attention to one another and our urgent necessity to keep hold of our points of view. That, I think, is the common tragedy of almost all human conflicts, that rapid breakdown from the first cool apprehension of an issue to heat confusion, and insistence. I do not know if indeed we raised our voices, but my memory has an effect of raised voices, and when at last I went out of the house, it seemed to me that the men-servants in the hall were as hushed as beasts before a thunderstorm, and all of them quite fully aware of the tremendous catastrophe that had come to Martin's. And moreover, 
as I recalled afterwards with astonishment. I went past them and out into the driving rain unprotected, and not one of them stirred a serviceable hand. What was it we said? I have a vivid sense of declaring, not once only but several times, that Mary and I were husband and wife in the sight of God. I was full of the idea that now she must inevitably be mine. I must have spoken to Justin at times as if he had come merely to confirm my view of the long dispute there had been between us. For a while my mind resisted his extraordinary attitude that the matter lay between him and Mary, that I was in some way an interloper. It seemed to me there was nothing for it now but that Mary should stand by my side and face Justin with the world behind him. I remember my confused sense that presently she and I would have to go straight out of Marden's, and she was wearing a tea-gown, easy and open, and the flimsiest of slippers. Any packing, any change of clothing, struck me as an incredible anticlimax. I had visions of our going forth, hand in hand. Outside was the sowing of a coming storm. A chill wind drove a tumult of leaves along the terrace. The door slammed and yawned open again, and then came the rain. Justin, I remember, still talking, closed the door. I tried to think how I could get to the station five miles away, and then what we could do in London. We should seem rather odd visitors to an hotel, without luggage. All this was behind my valiant demand that she should come with me, and come now. And then my mind was lanced by the thin edge of realization that she did not intend to come now, and that Justin was resolved she should not do so. After the first shock of finding herself discovered, she had stood pale but uncowed before her bureau, with her eyes rather on him than on me. Her hands, I think, were behind her upon the edge of the writing flap, and she was a little leaning upon them. She had the watchful, alert expression of one who faces an unanticipated but by no means overwhelming situation. She cast a remark to me. "'But I do not want to come with you,' she said. "'I have told you I do not want to come with you.' All her mind seemed concentrated upon what she should do with Justin. "'You must send him away,' he was saying. "'It's an abominable thing.' It must stop. How can you dream it should go on? But you said yourself when you married me I should be free. I should own myself. You gave me this house. What, to disgrace myself? I was moved to intervene. You must choose between us, Mary, I cried. It is impossible you should stay here. You cannot stay here. She turned upon me, a creature at bay. Why shouldn't I stay here? Why must I choose between two men? I want neither of you. I want myself. I'm not a thing. I'm a human being. I'm not your thing, Justin, nor your Stephen. Yet you want to quarrel over me like two dogs over a bone. I am going to stay here, in my house. It's my house. I made it. Every room of it is full of me. Here I am. She stood there, making this magnificently extravagant claim. Her eyes blazing blue, her hair a little disheveled, with a strand across her cheek. Both I and Justin spoke together, and then turned in helpless anger upon one another. I remember that with the clumsiest of weak gestures he bade me be gone from the house, and the I, with a now rather deflated rhetoric, answered, I would go only with Mary at my side. And there she stood, less like a desperate rebel against the most fundamental social relations than an indignant princess, and demanded of us and high heaven, Why should I be fought for? Why should I be fought for? And then, abruptly, she gathered her skirts in her hand and advanced. Open that door, Stephen, she said 
and was gone with a silken whirl and rustle from our presence. We were left regarding one another with blank expressions. Her departure had torn the substance out of our dispute. For the moment we found ourselves left with a new situation, for which there is as yet no tradition of behavior. We had become actors in that new human comedy that is just beginning in the world, that comedy in which men still dispute the possession and the manner of the possession of woman according to the ancient rules, while they on their side are determining ever more definitely that they will not be possessed. We had little to say to one another, mere echoes and endorsements of our recent declarations. She must come to me, said I, and he, I will save her from that at any cost. That was the gist of our confrontation, and then I turned about and walked along the gallery towards the entrance, with Justin following me slowly. I was full of the wrath of baffled heroics. I turned towards him with something of a gesture. Down the perspective of the white and empty gallery he appeared small and perplexed. The panes of the tall French windows were slashed with rain. End of chapter 6, part 6 to 10